I'm Nancy Rosenblum, the associate editor of the Annual Review of Political Science. I'm here with my colleague, Sidney Verba, who's the Carl Fortzheimer University professor, emeritus, and research professor in the Department of Government at Harvard University. Sid is past president of the American Political Science Association and the recipient of many prizes, best book prizes for the best book in political science, in American national policy, in women in politics, and he's also the winner of awards for career contributions to political science and social science, including the 2002 International Huta Prize, otherwise known as the Skite Prize, the uh, Warren Millow Prize, and the James Madison Prize from the American Political Science Association. I hope this conversation will help to illuminate Sid's contributions to the discipline. Sid, welcome. Thank you. You've just returned from your 50th American Political Science Association convention. And in the introductory essay you've written for this annual review volume, you affirm your strong identity as a political scientist. How did that identity develop? What were the early roots of your interest in politics, in your family, and in the events of your youth? Well, I always think of myself as having been born in a very important political year, which was 1932 which was right at the beginning of the Depression and right, of course, at FDR's election. And my earliest memories, I think, are of both of those things. My parents were immigrants and had a little mom-and-pop curtain store in Brooklyn, and they spent a lot of time during the Depression worrying about how they were going to get from week to week. And, of course, like many people of their background, they were fervent uh, FDR uh, supporters. Um, so there was always politics, even from the time I can have my earliest memories. Uh, the family we belonged to covered what I sometimes describe as the full range of American political views, from the extreme left to the moderate left. <laughs> uh, we had an uncle who was a fairly high person in the American Communist Party. Uh, my father didn't like him for that reason. My father was a moderate uh, Democrat. Uh, something that I inherited and have re remained ever since. Uh, one of my first political memories uh, goes to the 1944 election when uh, billboards came up all over New York with a sign on it, clear it with Sydney. And I was really taken aback by that, how wonderful it was. And it was a statement by Franklin Delano Roosevelt how wonderful it was that he was really thinking that he wanted to clear it with me until my father explained to me that Sidney was Sidney Hillman, the head of the Amer Algam Amalgamated, Amalgamated uh, Clothing Workers, and that this was a billboard put up by the Republicans, uh, one, to suggest that Hillman was, uh, that Roosevelt was dominated by the unions and maybe by the Communist Party, and also, I think, to give a little bit of an anti-Semitic uh, message. Uh, and that kind of thing both I remember as a personal uh, event and something that's colored my view of Republicans <laughs> ever since. I shouldn't begin this as a political scientist with a partisan comment, but these days what else can one say? Well, how did you make your way from that partisan background into political science? Who were your teachers and influences? I think it really was a gradual drift I mean, I was an undergraduate major in history and lit, which was a humanities. I took maybe one course in the government department at Harvard. Uh, but I then decided that when I graduated, I wanted to do something interesting. All my friends were going to law school. I wanted to go into the Foreign Service. And my then fiance and now my wife of 56 years thought that sounded exciting. So I applied to and was admitted to the Woodrow Wilson School in Princeton, which was one of the places you could train for the Foreign Service. But it was the McCarthy era, and I decided this was not a good time to go into the Foreign Service. And since in the Woodrow Wilson School you took a lot of courses in the politics department, I drifted into that department, uh, which was a wonderful, lucky break for me because it was small, very good, with a number of really very good uh, professors. And so I worked in particular with Gabriel Almond, who was the really rising star of American political science, but with a lot of other people. Your early work, Sid, was in comparative politics. And mm. in fact, I think you coined the phrase comparative political behavior to try to describe what you were doing. 
Where was the field of comparative politics when you began to work with Gabriel Almond on the civic culture? And in particular, what led you to the revolutionary development of using large-scale cross-national surveys applied to political culture? Well, on what comparative politics was then, it was not comparative politics. Uh, there was always a course in American politics, and many of them, and the courses in comparative politics were usually courses about Britain or France or Germany or several countries. There really was no systematic comparison. I then got involved in, these com in this particular comparative survey study, which involved comparing across countries in some systematic manner. Uh, and I was also involved in a field that was just beginning everybody thought was important, though nobody really knew what it meant, including me, which was political behavior. So uh, working with Almond, we were working on comparative political behavior. And to show you the fragmentation of the discipline back then, the first job interview I went to, which was at a fairly prestigious college, they had two openings, comparative politics and political behavior. Uh, and they asked me which field I was in. And I, at that moment, invented the term comparative political behavior. I then went up, was interviewed, thought it went very well. And of course, I didn't get a job offer. And it was about three or four years later when I met the chair of the department who said to me, oh, yeah, Verba, tell me, did you ever decide what field you were in? <laughs> uh, and you had to be sort of identified. How I got to work on a comparative survey study, which was really innovative in those days, uh, I should say was one of the other things that was lucky for me is that I was lucky. I was working with Almond, and he was the one who decided he wanted to do a comparative survey and hired me as his research assistant, uh, which I took as a job uh, because uh, I needed money because my wife, who was like good wives back then supporting me by teaching elementary school, had become pregnant and I had to make some money. And as my in-laws told me, it was about time. Uh, and so I got a job working for him as a research assistant and then out of his generosity, I got uh, promoted to being a co-author on what then turned out to be a very important book, though I didn't realize that it was going to be when I was working on it. What do you think holds up from that book and what not? That's a very interesting question. We, I just came back from an, a, an anniversary celebration of the 50th anniversary of the civic culture in Mexico City, Mexico being one of the countries that was in the uh, civic culture. And they brought together people from all over the world to talk about comparative uh, survey research. And one of the things that holds up is that it really opened up a new way of doing research and thinking about research that has now become so common uh, and really important that one of its great uh, legacies was opening a new way of studying countries cross-nationally uh, and also of studying what was then called political culture, again, something that no one knew exactly what it was, uh, but it opened up brand new fields. Uh, if you look back, and I said something about this at this conference at the Civic Culture, from a uh, retrospective view, a lot of it was naive. I mean, today you wouldn't do the simple surveys we did, you wouldn't do the simple statistical analysis, and <clears throat> even the notion of a civic culture was a very important one, but it really wasn't worked out fully. Uh, but I say that that's insignificant compared with what, in fact, it accomplished in terms of what came next. Lots of other people began doing it. Uh, and I think it really had a transformative effect on a good deal of the discipline. Let me ask you a little bit more about this. The next study you did was a seven-nation study mm -hmm. of uh, civic participation. Right. Um, what did you learn from the first that changed the approach of the organization of the next one? Well, we learned several things. One was uh, the civic culture was done in what was then the American imperialist way of doing research. Almond and I designed it in our offices in Princeton. Uh, we wrote the questionnaire. Uh, we got survey organizations in other countries to do the survey for us. Uh, we collaborated, we consulted with local scholars and the like. It wasn't that we were closed, but it was really an American project done elsewhere. 
The next project was done fundamentally differently. It was done with collaboration from, with scholars from six other nations and the United States. And if you think that makes it one-sixth as easy, <laughs> it makes it six to the sixth uh, more difficult because everyone has a different view. Uh, but that was very, very important, both important in terms of the skills that they brought in the understanding of their own countries uh, and the legitimacy it brought that we were studying these countries. And I think that too has become a standard way of working. We then also learned from the civic culture <coughs> not to be so rigid in what we thought of as comparison. It turns out that any question in another language is a different question. There's no way of making it perfectly equivalent. And so we talked about functional equivalence, questions that sort of tap right. the same sort of thing and how one got around these kinds uh, of issues. And the other thing that I think was a breakthrough in the second study was one of the important reasons for doing comparative survey research is you can look at how people's attitudes and beliefs relate to each other in different institutional settings. So if you study in the United States, you've got one democracy of a particular sort. If you study across seven nations, they vary in very interesting ways. And what we tried to do was look at those variations systematically. So we looked at the role of mobilizing forces that were different from country to country, the role of political parties, the role of unions. And in a sense, we measured and looked at the impact of what is sometimes called American exceptionalism, that we don't have a socialist party, that we have weak unions. How does that affect who gets involved in politics? And I think that too represented a step forward systematically and self-consciously for, compar you know, for right. comparative uses of surveys. So you were smart enough to come in on the ground floor of large-scale social science survey research. And you write about joining Gabriel Almond as a research assistant that you, you said, I know a smattering of statistics and I was interested in surveys. Mm -hmm. You want to compare the state of the field today and the requirements placed on young scholars today 50 years later. I say something really about the contrast between the early period and what's going on now and maybe what are the technological or funding obstacles or opportunities that uh, have changed the field? Well, we did the civic culture uh, it was Almond who raised money from some foundations. They, of course, never heard of me. Uh, and it was a lot cheaper in those days. Uh, but it was something that was so new that someone like me, who had a smattering of statistics, as I say, and had been interested in surveys, could be technically competent to work with Almond, who didn't have those skills, had great vision, uh, and that we could work together. And I was adding value from that perspective. Uh, the kinds of statistics we used, the use of surveys today would be thought of as incredibly primitive. And the amount of statistics I knew then and have improved somewhat, no matter how much I've improved it, no graduate student in today's political science right. departments wouldn't be much more technically sophisticated. Right than I am. <coughs> I have continued working in the field uh, and have uh, done it again in a very intelligent way by getting intelligent collaborators who are really technically much more sophisticated than I am. I do find that though they can do things in a much more elaborate statistical way, I'm still as good as they are and maybe better in thinking about what it is we're really working on, what are the problems, right. how you conceptualize them, uh, and so forth. Right. And so that becomes a, you know, a quite important skill and I think was one of the things I was lucky enough to have and, and bring with me. Well, that brings us to the next set of questions I'd like to ask, which is about your work on participation mm -hmm. in America and the big questions that have really both motivated and guided 
your scholarship, your unwavering focus has been on political inequality. Mm -hmm. And I think it's captured by a subtitle of a 2002 article you wrote that says, that called The Unchanging Stratification of Participation. Mm -hmm. And the flip side of your interest in political activity is your concern to understand the meaning of political quiescence. I wondered if you could take us a little bit step by step through your thinking about how to study this question of uh, participation and stratification and um, the models that you've developed over the years to do that? Well, I think for good or ill, I have been somewhat of a person with tunnel vision, but it's a big tunnel going in an important direction. That is, I've worked on various things that are not connected to participation and so forth, but there's been a long series of works on the general question of political equality, which you know, comes from some general views about the nature of democratic politics that in a true ideal democracy, the government should give equal consideration to the preferences and needs of all citizens. It's embodied in the notion of one person, one vote, uh, which is very different from the notion we have of what's ideal in the economy. There's no sense of one person, one dollar. And in fact, one of the big themes of my work is the incongruity between these two and how inequality in the economy undercuts the reality or possibility of equality uh, in the political system. So it's been that general theme, but approached in a variety of ways. For instance, mm -hmm. the second book, the one on uh, political participation in political equality, the Seven Nations Study, raises the question of what is the impact on the equality of participation of the history of the party system uh, and whatever it was that made the United States not have an active socialist party or have a labor union mm -hmm. system that up through the Gompers era was not really involved in mobilizing people to politics but protecting certain occupations. What are the consequences of that for what turns out to be who's active in politics and how equal is that uh, activity. Uh, and then went on from there to a bunch of different books that took the same themes, the same concerns uh, from different perspectives. I did a book uh, with Kay Schlossman on unemployment. This was done in the uh, Carter era when there was a, an unemployment rate almost like we have today, in fact, very similar to what we have today. And the interesting thing was it was a time in which uh, all groups in America were organizing. Women were, minorities were, gays were, the handicapped were, the unemployed were not uh, organizing. And we sort of mm -hmm. did a survey of a very large number of unemployed and a number of parallel people who were employed, trying to figure out why the unemployed didn't organize around unemployment. And it was a very important question in which we got some you know, interesting answers. We then have done works, I have with various collaborators, on particular groups, uh, on racial differences, did a book uh, with Nancy Burns and Kay Schlossman on gender, why despite the fact that women had the vote for almost 85 years at the time we did the book, uh, they still were less active in politics than men, uh, and why was it? I want to come back to that book, okay. but let me first ask you, when and how did you develop the civic voluntarism model? Because that really was an advance over SES, which right. is what you and others had been using. So maybe you want to just very briefly describe the uh, factors, you know, uh, motivation sure. and resources and recruitment and how that evolved. Well, this was the next really big book I worked on with two collaborators uh, on participation, and it raised the same question I had raised earlier, who gets active in politics? And the earlier book really came to a descriptive conclusion, people with more money and more mm -hmm. education, higher in right. SES, were more likely to be active. This book, this next book, really tried to ask what was, what was it that led to activity by such people, and we looked at a variety of what we call factors. And we had a theme that came out on, finally on the back, the, the back cover of this book, which listed the three reasons why people 
didn't get active mm -hmm. in politics. And the three reasons are that they didn't want to, they couldn't, uh, and nobody asked. And it turned out that these were sort of factors that people who had more education and more income uh, were more likely to be motivated for a variety of reasons, uh, one of them being the role of education. Uh, they were also more likely to be capable to be able to because they had the resources needed to be politically active, like money, which is very important, but also skills uh, and the ability to do things. And lastly, they were, mo uh, lastly, they were in networks where people asked them to be politically active. Uh, and so this became a model of who is active in politics that has been kind of the base model in lots of additional work. People have modified right. it, improved it, but uh, it was something that grew up as we were working on this. Now, more recently, you did this book with Nancy Burns and Kay Schlossman, The Private Roots of Public Action. And there, I think you tried to explain the origin of these participatory factors in non-political institutions. How did you make that step, and how important do you think it's been? Oh, I think it was really important, because when we were asking the question, why are men and women different in how active they are, uh, we could look at, in a sense, the institutional impacts on men and women. For instance, one of the things we find that makes people politically active is getting a job. You get a job, you get connections there for what other people, you get skills on the job that you can then use uh, for political activity, you make money on the job, and so forth and so on. And we looked at the institution of marriage in relation to getting a job, which leads you into politics. And it turns out that when men and women get married, even today, it's getting less and less to be the case, men increase their political involvement and women decrease it because men go into the labor market much more than women. And the time when we were thinking this through, the, there still was a big difference. Uh, and so it was the way in which institutions work differently for men and women, uh, and not the same as some people think. So we looked at these as different populations and a variety of other things, the kinds of expectations that are placed upon people uh, and so forth. Is there a new phase of this work coming up? Well. Uh, we now have another big book we're working on that, uh, fortunately or unfortunately, is probably going to be as heavy as the previous book. Uh, we decided after maybe a decade that we were going to write another book because there were questions that had been left unanswered that we wanted to fill out. But we were going to make it a more general book, which would be not like everything else that I had worked on, which is our books filled with what I describe as mind-numbing statistics. We never have a sentence without having six tables showing the sentence is true, mm -hmm. and we decided we weren't going to gather any more data, huh. which, as I once described it to somebody, is like telling the man at the customs a desk in the airport, pay no attention to those little cellophane packages with white powder in them. <laughs> we are addicted. So we then decided to build some data about not the role of individuals in political activity, but the role of uh, organized interests, and have put together the largest database of organized interests, I think, ever, with 35,000 examples of, organized, of groups organized in Washington. Uh, we have ten, four different years with about 10,000, a little less than 10,000 in each year, and we are analyzing those data. Uh, to come to a conclusion we sort of knew was there, it doesn't surprise anybody, mm -hmm was that if you add organized interests as modes of expressing citizen preferences to individuals as modes of expressing citizen preferences, it only makes the inequality more extreme. And so that what we find whenever we turn around and look at American politics, inequality seems to be there, persistent, and to some extent growing. Which brings me <laughs> to my last and maybe most depressing question in this series, and that is, uh, does political science have a solution to this persistent problem of stratified participation? Yeah. And I'm thinking back to your presidential address to mm -hmm. the American Political Science Association called the Citizen as a Respondent, where you seem to suggest that responding to a survey is a somewhat equalizing form of political participation. What do you think now about that? Well, I think that that is true, was true that surveys now are not only 
things done by scholars, but they're things that appear in the newspapers whenever anything happens, and there are thousands of them. Uh, and in some sense, if they're done well, which you can't really trust anybody, but a few organizations that do them well, you can't trust either mm -hmm. of the political parties and so forth, uh, that they do tell you something about what the public is thinking uh, because people are asked questions and they answer them. So in some sense it is an equalizing force, though not completely. But our general finding has been uh, that inequality is persistent and if you write a long book on something that you think normatively you think is not a good thing, we think that mm -hmm. there are reasons why equal participation would not be that good. We have lots, we look at the dark side of it, but in, on balance we think this is essential to, to democracy. Uh, you usually have a last chapter with, uh, to use the Lenin term, what is to be done, and you talk about all the things that could be changed that are really going to turn this upside down, and we have three chapters in the book at the end about ways of breaking the persistence. One is what we call mobilization. When I was a kid, I learned that if you really want to get somewhere, you organize. This was the word of, of the left. Uh, and so we look at mobilizing people. And sure, there's a lot of literature on how particular organizations have mobilized African Americans or women. But if you look at mobilization more generally across the whole population, who calls you up in the evening to ask you to take part in politics, uh, we find that the people who do the calling are what we call rational prospectors. They look, as Willie Sutton right. would say, where the money is. So they call people who have money to ask them to participate. So that increases uh, political inequality. We looked at data on the internet to see whether people who use the internet uh, are going to be more equal because it's easy to use. You can send messages very easily. And of course, it is in the opposite direction, mm -hmm. either because some people don't have the equipment or some people who have the equipment don't use it for that purpose. And then we have a whole chapter about various reforms that are suggested, which are either very unlikely to be implemented, like changing the Electoral College, or aren't going to make any difference, like changing the campaign finance laws, which they change every couple of years. And for every change right. in the law, there are 500 lawyers figuring out how to get around it. Exactly. So it's kind of a disappointing uh, response, but it's the best we could do. One last thing on your work before we turn to some other things. Um, looking back, what would you say was your most surprising finding? Or on the other hand, what, what assumption do you think you worked with for a while that's proved to be distressingly wrong? Good question. I think the most, we've had specific surprising findings. Some of the data about the, the mm -hmm. internet and how it works mm -hmm. didn't come out the way we expected it. The biggest data surprise is actually just the persistence of socioeconomic status. We did some of the only work on intergenerational political activity. That is, there's a lot of literature in sociology about the intergenerational transmission of occupations or income. People who come from wealthy families are likely to be wealthy for a variety of obvious reasons or to have come from uh, families with high occupational characteristics, they go into high occupations. We look at families in which people had parents who were politically active. Uh, and we all know that in a society in which you've got families like the Bush family or the Kennedys, that things are transferred from generation to generation, but it's true also in the general right. public. And we find that, uh, however, what's most important for that transmission the fact that your parents were politically active and you're politically active uh, is the result of two paths from generation to generation. One is the political path. Your parents were politically interested and you grow up being politically mm -hmm. interested. That explains perhaps one third of the continuity. The other two thirds is explained by socioeconomic status. Your parents were well educated if they were interested in politics. Therefore, you went to a good college or got a good job and that indirect role of education and income seems even more powerful than the direct transmission of politics. So the fact that it comes yeah. back and back and back, in fact, we have a line we're going to put in the book, which we hope you as a political theorist will appreciate it, but I'm not sure everybody else will, is that uh, 
we have lots of different subject matters in the book, but the one thing that's there is SES. We talk about uh, a fox of a book with a hedgehog of a conclusion. <laughs> you know, lots of things, but one big thing is our overwhelming story. Um, Sid, survey techniques have been crucial to the collaborative nature of your work. You've had a lot of co-authors. What's the secret to successful collaboration? What can you tell what I'll describe as young political science newlyweds? How can they stay married? Well, one, you've got to have patience. You've got to listen a lot to other people who may be saying things you disagree with. Uh, and that's very important. And, you know, I've had clashes with lots of collaborators of the same nationality or other places, but you've got to sort of hang together. And one of the things that does help is, is the technology of survey research. You have certain ways in which you have to do things. You have to talk about similarities of questions. So it constrains. It the, constrains. Right, yeah. I mean, if we're sitting down to do, let me do the history of democracy in these seven countries, it would go all over the place, legitimately. If you say, well, let's do a survey, uh, it forces us to sit at the table and try to figure out how to do it. Uh, and as I say, we've become much looser in what we do. Our understanding of what it is we're studying doesn't have the rigidity we had in the civic culture where we sort of wanted each question to be translated literally, uh, and we no longer do that. So it helps a lot. I wonder if you want to say something about political science as an open discipline. You've borrowed from other fields. Mm -hmm. You've crossed uh, the subfields of political science. You very early on were what's now called a multi-method mm -hmm. researcher. Uh, how, is it, how much can younger scholars today exploit this? Has it increased? And what do you think has been the importance of this for political science? Oh, I think it's been terrible. I mean, one of the things I like about political science is that it is an open discipline, unlike some di two different pol polarities. One are disciplines that fragment because they have methodological disputes and they break apart or they have ideological disputes. And I was once involved when I was president of the American Political Science Association in meetings of the various social science and humanities head, uh, organizational heads. And I found that in general political scientists, though we had as wide an ideological spread, and methodological spreads that were quite wide. We had stayed together as an organization, and I looked across other disciplines, the historians, the anthropologists, the sociologists, God save us, uh, and the Modern, uh, Modern Languages Association, even the American Musicological Society, which I know about because my wife is mm -hmm. a musicologist, was split between the feminist musicologists and the <laughs> postmodern musicologists and so forth. Mm -hmm. And we managed to hang together. And when I gave my presidential address, I commented on that and said it gave me great pleasure. And I asked, why would this be the case? And I had two reasons. One, that we were just nicer people, which may be true, uh, but may not be the strongest. And the other was that our business is in figuring out how to make collective decisions under circumstances where people have widely different preferences and values, and that we understand uh, the nature of compromise. Not all of us do it, but at least we try to do it. So I thought that was a, uh, uh, the other important thing I told the uh, audience there, which was gave me even greater joy, got the largest applause, was pointing out to them that during the previous year, the uh, return on the endowment of the American Political Science Association had been higher than the return of the, on the endowment of the American Economic uh, <laughs> Association. This brought tumultuous applause. Right. Sid, uh, you're celebrated not only for your work, but also for the support you've provided to professional associations and to universities over the course of your career. You were the director of the Harvard College Libraries, a massive library system for over 20 years at the early stages of digitization, too, when you had to negotiate mm -hmm. with Google over the Google Books project. Since you've retired, you've taken on the chairmanship of the um, Committee on Human Rights for the National Academy of Science. Why has it been important to do that, and what's the connection to political science? Well, one answer that I sometimes give as to why I do these things is I was known to various people as the Edo Annie of the social sciences. Edo Annie, as you may remember or may not remember, 
is the woman in Oklahoma who sings, I'm just a girl who can't say no. And so I say yes <laughs> to all sorts of things. And sometimes I regret it and sometimes I don't. But in general, I mean, I have found these other jobs are both interesting. Uh, taking on the directorship of the Harvard Library in my, I guess, at early 60s maybe? No, I guess mid-50s, I think was the uh, way of avoiding a midlife crisis. I mean, I didn't go off in other bad ways. I took a job that was really different from what I had ever done, very challenging, so that I could continue doing my research and teaching, but nevertheless, this gave me, gave my mind a new direction to go in. Uh, and so this has been true of, of a variety of things. I've done them around the university. Uh, I also, I guess, have some kind of a civic obligation feeling in myself. I also find that it's, it is useful, often not in a very specific way, but it is useful being a political scientist. I mean, in the, in the library job, I was not a librarian. I still couldn't quite explain to you the Library of Congress cataloging system, which is the basis of everything. Uh, but nevertheless, I found that I had, I was better off being a political scientist than a library scientist because so much of what we were doing involved now the collaboration among libraries, uh, libraries in Harvard, which Harvard, as you know, has a very diverse and dispersed organizational structure, but we spent a lot of time collaborating with the Library of Congress, the New York Public Library, consortium of libraries around the country. And it was very important to have the kind of political scientist sense of how institutions work. This has been true also in my work as chair of the Human Rights Committee at the National Academy. I did it because I thought this was something important to do in terms of human rights, which is an important goal. Uh, but I also found that uh, the members of the committee are, like most members of the National Academy, are natural scientists. I'm a social scientist. And I find that they're all infinitely smarter than I am, certainly in their field, but in general I get the impression. But nevertheless, I have a sense of how social institutions work and how you negotiate. That's helpful. And so it, it, it's a nice mixture. We're coming to the end of our time. Um, you're famous, finally, Sid, as a master of jokes. And colleagues, myself included, come to you all the time when they need an apt joke for a specific occasion. You have jokes about lawyers and rabbis and priests and economists. What about political science? Good question. I mean, I know lots of jokes about lawyers and economists, psychiatrists. We need one for this interview. OK, for political science. I don't think that there are any that I can think of that are directly about political scientists. Uh, here's one. Uh, in the book, uh, Designing Social Inquiry, that Gary King and Bob Cohane and I wrote, that's called, known as KKV, we talk about description and how it is important not only to have these fancy explanations, but you have to have accurate descriptions of what's going on, and that this involves clear statement of facts uh, that are verifiable. But we also talk about what we call descriptive inference. That is, you don't want to know that this happened at this place. You want to take a fact and make it more general by inferring its implications. So I'll tell you a story. Like many of my stories, it's a Jewish story. It's about an elderly Jew on a train uh, in Eastern Europe in the old days. And he overhears that the young man sitting in his compartment uh, is going to his village. And so he thinks to himself, he's going to my village. But why is he going to my village? There are only two kinds of people in my village. There are Jews and peasants. He's too well dressed to be a peasant, therefore he must be a Jew. But why would a strange Jew be going to my village? We don't sell anything in particular. Therefore, he must be going to look for a wife. But the only family in my village that has an eligible daughter is the Shapiro family. Therefore, he must be going to marry Shapiro's daughter. But Shapiro would never let his daughter marry a stranger, yet I don't recognize this young man. Therefore, he must be the son of some family that moved away from the village when he was very young, and that's why I don't recognize him. But the only family in the village that had a young son and moved away was the Kostrinsky family. So therefore, he must be Kostrinsky. 
Kostrinsky's son. And I, and I know Kostrinsky. Uh, he moved to Budapest. And if he moved to Budapest, he would change his name to Kosuth, and his son would become a doctor like his father. So as they're getting off the train, he walks up to the young man and he says, excuse me, Dr. Kosuth, but if the Shapiros don't meet you at the station, I can show you the way to your fiancé's home. The young man looks at him very puzzled and says, but how did you know? Logic, young man, logic. <laughs> so I think political science includes finding <laughs> facts and logically deducing things from them. Thank you, Sidney Verba. Thank you very much.